stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? If you have encountered the living God, that is as applicable to us right now as it is throughout eternity. Have you encountered God? You see, worship, worship seeks to praise God and to thank God. I would send you to the book of Psalms. Now all of Scripture is filled with His praises. But the book of Psalms, it, it just resonates with me. Some of the songs are harsh. Some of the songs will kind of set you back and thinking, what, that's actually in the Bible? But most of the Psalms are filled with, with adoration, with, with loyalty, with devotion, with proskonecho, with kissing toward God. Two things that I want to emphasize here. Praise Him, thank Him. First of all, praise Him for who He is. He is indeed the living God. There is no other. The people of this world will define a multitude of gods, will they not? The prophets of the Old Testament talk about the idols of the nations that surrounded them and says they have eyes but cannot see, ears but cannot hear, mouths but cannot speak. But we, we worship the living God. And when we begin to understand who He is, when we know Him, worship flows. So we praise Him because He is, he is the One whose Spirit hovered above the waters of a formless world. And then by His very Word called everything that is into being. Can you imagine that? Let there be. And there was. And He is worthy of praise because He's the Creator. And all of creation sings His praises. All of creation declares His eternal power and His divine nature. He is the one who called forth the people of His own. And in the book of Exodus, which we've already referenced, will send ten plagues upon the nation of Egypt so that they would surrender to His authority and swing wide the door of deliverance to the Hebrew people. And as they fled, as they sought their freedom, He's the one who parts the waters of the Red Sea and calls them through on dry land. Praise Him for who He is. He is the lawgiver. Not a law that brings death, but as Paul says, a spirit that gives life. God sets the boundaries that says, this is how I created you as people, as humanity. And when you live within the parameters in which I created you, you will find yourself to be fully human. And we look at Him and we praise Him because He is the lawgiver. He is the one who sits upon a throne in glory. You know, we're going to be praying for our nation and for an upcoming election and we're so used to being a part of a democratic republic. And if you don't know what that means, Go talk to your high school civics teacher. A democratic republic. And so we see those who govern us as what? Public servants. Now they may not always act like it. But that's how we see them. And that's how our system is structured. And because of how we live as Americans in what we consider a free society, we have forgotten what it is to live under a sovereign, under a king. 
Our revolution was about coming out from under that, but our conversion to Christ is coming into a submission to that. Not an earthly king, but a divine king, an eternal king. And so we see God high and seated upon His throne and we praise Him for who He is. He is my Lord, my Master, my King, my Sovereign. His Word is authoritative. His Word is final in my life. And I praise Him. He is Abba. The Aramaic word for father. Do any of you watch NCIS now in its 400th year of reruns? Yeah. That's one of our, in, uh, one of our Netflix binge watch shows. If you get into the seasons where the young Jewish woman, Ziva David, is, when she talks to her dad who is still in Israel, what does she call him? Abba. To the follower of Jesus, to the Christian, God, creator, lawgiver, deliverer, king, is Abba. Father. Maybe even daddy. In a very intimate sense. And so we can turn into the book of Hebrews and we find that this God who sits upon the throne as king is also the giver of grace. And he says that we can, because of Jesus, come into his presence, to his throne of grace, to find help in our time of need. So he is the helper. He is the grace giver. He is the one who strengthens us. And we praise him for who he is. And we thank Him, secondly, we thank Him for what He's done. Now much of what I just said covers both of those aspects, does it not? Because the things that God does flow from who He is in His nature and His character. Because He is a deliverer, He delivers His people. Because He is the King, He sets the standards for his people because he is the giver of grace. He helps us in our time of need. Thank him for what he's done. If you read through the book of Psalms, you'll find that David and Korah and the others who pen the Psalms, they're constantly looking back and recounting the deeds of God. Great are your deeds, O God. Great are the things that you have done. Many of the Psalms do look back to the time of Moses and the ten plagues and the parting of the Red Sea. What has God done in your life? What has He done? Sometimes we need to tell the story again, don't we? Sometimes we need to tell the story again. As a preacher for many years, I wrestled at Christmas and Easter. Why? Those are wonderful times of the year. Yeah, but because there's going to be people coming who, well, they only come on Christmas and Easter. And we want to make the service something that really speaks to them, something that really impacts them. And, 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 and Christmas and Easter, it's always the same story. And I used to wrestle with, how do we make this year better than last year? And I finally came to the realization, don't. Just tell the story. The incarnation that God was wrapped in human flesh, and was born in Bethlehem. The resurrection that sin and death have both been defeated in an empty tomb. I heard God tell me, not in an audible voice, I did, no, in my heart, why are you trying to improve on something I already gave out to you in perfect form? Eh, okay. You, you see, in church, we oftentimes have what I call the amusement park syndrome. Now, I'll tell you, I don't like amusement parks. If you do, good for you. 
I don't like amusement parks. Roller coasters make me puke. The tilt-a-whirl, they just make me puke on other people. <laughs> well, it does. You're spinning around, you spray it everywhere. Can you talk about this stuff in church? Yeah, and we're online too. I don't even like the Ferris wheel. You'd think, oh man, that's so cool. You get way up there and you get a look out. And it, no. I don't like going down through the games with the carnies because they're all rigged. You know, I can go to toys. Well, I can't go to Toys R Us anymore. Let's have a moment of silence. I can go to the toy store and I can buy that stuffed animal for 15 bucks that at a carny, I'll pay out 110 in attempts to knock over those three milk bottles. But what is it about an amusement park that they have to do? They have to do. Every so often, they have to erect a new roller coaster. They have to devise a new ride that outdoes the former so that the thrill seekers, so that the adrenaline junkies will say, I need to go back to Six Flags and spend 75 bucks just to get in the door so that I can ride the new ride. Churches do that all the time. How do we outdo what we did before so that people will stay interested? Here's what we need to do. We need simply to introduce them to the living God. Because if you have encountered the living God, worship will flow from your heart. I told first service I had no idea what second service would be like because I can't remember what I said in first service. I kind of got off script. I don't, I'm done. If you guys will come forward. I want to close. I want to close with... <laughs> You ever have one of those? You know? I knew I was going to say something. I, d I do know how I want to close, though. All right? I do know how I want to close. I used Bart Millard's uh, I Could Only Imagine to try to bring us to today. But there is a day coming that I think sets before us a wonderful picture of what yet is to come but what our worship should be a foretaste of. In the book of Revelation, chapter 5, beginning at verse 11, Then I looked. I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders. The number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. And they were saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. To receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea, all things in them I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. And if we skip over two chapters to chapter 7, John writes, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, palm branches were in their hands, and they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sits upon the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God.
Have you encountered the living God? If you have, you will find it's impossible to not worship. Whether it be in a woodland chapel, a fine church building, a grand cathedral, someone's basement or a prison cell where Christianity has been outlawed. If you have encountered the living God, you will find it is impossible to not worship. So as we sing this song, I want you to be a worshiper. But there may be some here today who have never stepped in to that relationship with the living God. And as we sing, we invite you to join in the eternal song, the eternal worship through faith and repentance and baptism into Christ. Would you stand as we sing? Praise Him for who He is, Almighty God. We thank Him for what He has done. He is my righteousness. He has made me righteous in Christ. Worship Him. You may be seated. We're going to tell the story one more time as Bill comes and leads us before the table and we share in the Lord's Supper. Do this in remembrance of me. That's one of my favorite parts of worship, is to remember Lord Jesus, who gave his life for us and gave us deliverance that we may have eternal life and made us keepers of the light. Jesus is the ultimate light giver, he said. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's a radical thing for anyone to claim, but Jesus said it to affirm his relationship with his heavenly Father, the creator of light and life, who sent him. We look to Jesus for salvation, follow his teaching. We're stored in relationship with God. And he gives us never new power and purpose. He's transforming life and love, the light of all mankind, shines in us and through us and out of the, a dark and sometimes dangerous world, which we're going through right now. As believers in Jesus, we become keepers of the light. May others see his light shine from us and discover the life and hope he can only give us. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I praise you for your light and love. Help me to shine for you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
We're so thankful that you were able to join us today, both in person and online. I hope that you will be able to, uh, you will leave from this place and go out and just enjoy the, the beautiful day and the sunshine and, and uh, just have a great week. Would you please stand and sing with us? Oh, yes. And don't, please don't leave your pew until you're dismissed and please don't congregate in the narthex. Repeat. Okay. Please stand and sing with us.